So hi everyone, thanks, thanks for joining. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, how we can use FICO to monitor uh, capabilities and all the work that we have done in order to expand FICO to monitor capability. Uh, so let's just introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Stefano and I'm a security researcher at SysDig. And with me uh, today is presenting uh, Lorenzo Susini, which is an open source engineer at SysDig. Uh, we are both from, uh, from Italy and we are both um, uh, FICO contributor. So let's start for, for, for today and let's start with uh, talking about container um, uh, isolation. So we all know uh, container is, is a, a, a great way to, uh, to deploy our, our, uh, our application and transport our code. However, we also know that um, containers aren't uh, security boundaries. Um, so what uh, makes um, container secure and what makes uh, container isolation are all the layers that are around containers and in here are reported some of them. Um, but we have also, uh, we have capabilities, Secomp, Parmore, but we have also uh, Linux, uh, Linux uh, namespaces and Cgroup, for instance. So all, all these layers uh, come together uh, to bring uh, uh, container, uh, uh, container isolation. Uh, today, uh, for today, the main topic will be uh, capabilities, but let's just introduce also a Parmore and Secomps. Uh, so capabilities are a way to um, restrict uh, the, priv the privileges that are uh, permitted in, uh, in containers. Uh, Secomps instead are, um, is Linux feature that can be used to restrict uh, syscalls and the argument that we can pass to, to, to syscalls. And also Aparmor uh, is a, a mandatory access control framework that can be used to uh, detect on uh, programs and we can enforce that specific programs can uh, have uh, specific access to objects. Uh, so for instance, uh, we can say a specific program can have access or read access uh, to, uh, to uh, I don't know, ATC Passwd, but not to ATC Shadow. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, by default, when, when we use Docker and we, and we deploy a container, all these security layers are enabled by default in order to provide uh, the uh, least privileged concept. And, and that's enabled by default, so we don't need to provide any uh, particular flags or we we'll set uh, particular flags, it's all enabled by default. Um, today, uh, we talk about how we can use FICO to, since FICO is able to, um, to have a visibility over what is going on inside our container, we can also, we extended also uh, FICO to see um, capabilities and which capabilities are actually available. So I let Lorenzo talk about capabilities and how they work. Yeah, thanks a lot Stefano for introducing me and let's now jump into the main topic. And well, as we all know, um, traditionally we used to distinguish Linux processes into two different categories, which are uh, privileged processes and unprivileged ones. So we can say that this model uh, is binary and it can be risky from a security perspective. This, this is because uh, uh, basically privileged processes that are those uh, running with effective user ID equal to zero um, can basically bypass all kernel permission checks, as we all know. And on the other hand, uh, privileged processes instead are those subject to all kernel permission checks and most of the time this is done using their own effective user ID or group ID. And from an attacker's standpoint, um, this model is exploitable, of course, um, by attacking directly um, uh, root processes. And once a root process is uh, compromised, the whole system is at risk of being compromised. For this reason, to improve its security model, uh, Linux has implemented capabilities. And capabilities to me are a clear example of applying and implementing the principle of least privilege. And in fact, as the model states, um, the power of the super user is split into distinct units that can be uh, independently granted or revoked. And these uh, allow us to run processes with uh, the minimal set of privileges that they need and hopefully an attacker gaining control about uh, gaining control on these uh, processes cannot uh, uh, compromise fully the system with the same ease as before. And the classic example about this is uh, the one of a, web, of a web server, for instance. 
And before the introduction of uh, capabilities, um, a web server needed to run uh, as root only because it had to open a privileged port, that is a port uh, below 1024. Uh, with capabilities, we can map this specific uh, um, pr uh, privilege to the a capability, which is in this case CapNet bind service. And uh, in the meanwhile, we, we can uh, let it not bypass uh, checks, for instance, on the file system, which is translated into a completely uh, different capability, which is in this, in this case CapDuck override. So uh, since we are here to implement proper monitoring uh, of capabilities with the purpose of detecting attacks, uh, our take on this is that uh, uh, not all capabilities are the same in terms of privileges they allow. In fact, some of them can be uh, defined as full root equivalent if gained by an attacker. And this is because if a, a, an attacker manages to gain one of them, uh, he can uh, possibly gain all of them uh, with other uh, uh, successful attacks, and as we will show later. So uh, let's go on, and uh, to, implement, to implement monitoring for capabilities, we have to better understand how they work. So basically, uh, capabilities are usually divided into three main sets, and which are the effective, the permitted, and inheritable set. And we can say that the effective, the effective set, uh, in a certain sense, uh, reflects a little bit the concept of the effective user ID. And in fact, this is the set that the kernel uses to perform actual permission check. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the um, permitted set, which is uh, basically the super set of all capabilities a process may ever acquire. And we can move capabilities from the effective set to the permitted set to let the effective set have only the privileges needed at a specific point in time. And last but not least, the inheritable set instead is used to control which capabilities are inherited upon exactly system call, uh, which is a pretty relevant uh, example. So uh, the inheritable set is um, used to perform specific uh, um, operations by the kernel to compute the new permitted set, as we can see in the next slide. And yeah, so this is how capabilities changes upon execvia. And what I want to stress here is that the kernel um, uh, use a specific set of rules to change capabilities of a process. And following the previous reasoning, we, we have to say that uh, the effective set um, should start empty when execvia is performed. This is because we want processes to uh, manually move with syscalls um, capabilities from the permitted set to the effective one. However, the, the kernel uh, also offered uh, backward compatibilities for uh, those binaries that can be defined as capability dumb, meaning that they are not able to move capabilities in between sets. And for doing that, the file effective sets, uh, the file effective flag, sorry, can be used and this is basically used to uh, move the new permitted set to the effective set so that, that the process uh, doesn't have to move capabilities uh, using other syscalls. So uh, now, now let's go back to container security and see how capabilities apply to it. And in fact, when talking about container security, uh, we basically have two different uh, uh, possibilities to let our workload run securely. So uh, the first one is to avoid container running as root. I think everybody here uh, knows about this uh, because basically uh, containers, like Stefan was saying before, uh, are not security in boundary like VMs. And if you're not using user namespaces, uh, root in the container is also root on the host. Uh, but sometimes we want uh, our containers to run privileges or privileged operations and we may be tempted to run them as root. So uh, what can we do? We can, we can use uh, capabilities. As we said, uh, capabilities on the other hand have the possibility to selectively choose the privileges that we want. Uh, anyway, we think that since capabilities are a lot and uh, sometimes it's really difficult to, to understand uh, which capabilities our workload needs, uh, we may end up in certain cases uh, running uh, excessively privileged uh, containers as well. And this is for sure not good from a security standpoint. And Stefano will now show you 
why and how capabilities can be used in real attacks. So thanks. Um, let's now uh, deep dive into uh, attacks on uh, container escaping. I just reported this slide just to uh, say basically what we have said before, right? So containers aren't isolated by default. And in this case, uh, we all know if we deploy a container as privileged, uh, this is far to be uh, isolated, right? So of course we are, we are still using container, we are still using Docker, uh, but this is far to be an isolated environment. Uh, this because if we use uh, capabilities and we see, uh, since we are talking about capabilities, with privileged, all the capabilities are, are available and all the capabilities can be used and loaded uh, by a possible attack. So uh, that just to mention that uh, when we deploy a container as privileged, we need to be careful that this is needed uh, and we, we need to be super careful on what we do. So let's start, let's start now really talk about um, container escaping uh, attacks. And in this case, let's start with, the, with this technique with the sysmodule uh, capability. Uh, so sysmodule is used to uh, load and unload kernel module. And for this technique, we have the only requirement yet that we have is uh, having the sysmodule capability. And how it works is pretty simple. So let's say that an attacker is able to get in, uh, uh, the, initial, uh, the initial foothold in a container and find out that the, the sysmodule capability is, is available and can be used. So the attacker just need to uh, drop the, um, uh, the module inside the container and since uh, the module is, is loaded in the kernel, all the, all the uh, malicious code is going to be executed in, in the host. So in this, in this example, one, once we load uh, the malicious uh, module, uh, the, the bash reverse shell is going to be executed. And so uh, the connection will, uh, will be open from the container's host back to the back to attacker machine. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, the attacker might need to, um, to compile the module inside the container because uh, just to be sure that uh, the module is gonna uh, uh, is gonna run, and and for this uh, the attacker might need the uh, the Linux header installed in the in the host. Otherwise, it's not possible to run this attack. Um, let's just move on with another technique, and in this case, we use the the capability uh, ptrace. Uh, in particular, ptrace is used to. Um, control other, um, other processes, but also with ptrace, we can also modify the, uh, the process memory to, uh, to inject um, arbitrary code, and we can also uh, modify the, the, uh, the pointer extraction in order to uh, run this uh, uh, arbitrary code. So in, in other words, uh, with ptrace, we can inject malicious code and actually execute it. So it's pretty powerful uh, capability. So uh, in this case, for this technique, we have three main uh, requirements. So first one is, of course, having the CSP trace available. Uh, the second one is a par we need to have a parmore set as unconfined or, um, or allowing P trace. And the third one is uh, the container and the host uh, needs to share the, uh, the PID address space. Uh, so, as said before, uh, let's say an attacker has access uh, to, the, to the container and was able to get initial access into the container and find out that see, the ptrace uh, capability is, uh, is available. So in this case, the attacker just needs to drop its own injector with a, with a malicious uh, shell code and find a process that he wants to inject and, and just execute the, the shell code. In this case, as we said before, since the, the address space is shared uh, between the container and the host, um, the, the, shell, the malicious shell code is going to be executed in the host. And that's why, if we, as, as we said before, if you open a, a, a reverse shell, the, the, the reverse shell uh, is going to start the connection from uh, the container's host back to the, to the attacker machine. And that's another attack, but using a different capability. Uh, I'll just close with, with um, the, last, uh, the last example for today. 
So this attack uh, is a well-known attack for container escaping. Uh, in this case, it was published on 2019 uh, on Twitter. Uh, in this case, the first example that is reported here on, on the left uh, required um, a privileged run as privileged, a container run as privileged. Um, after, after that, a new, a new exploit came out, and in, in this case, we just need the sysadmin capability in order to, um, to be successful. Um, for this specific attack, we have three requirements. So sysadmin is one, um, up armor with uh, uh, unconfined or just allowing mount operation. And also, uh, we need to have um, root user inside the container. So to understand how, how this works, we just need to uh, understand how notify and release works. And, and this is pretty easy. So notify, uh, uh, notify and release is a feature uh, in C group uh, v1 vers uh, version one and basically if it's enabled so it's set to one uh, once a, a container a, um, a process terminates um, the kernel is going to execute the code inside the release agent file so whatever code inside is inside the release agent is going to be executed by the kernel and and that's basically the um, how the exploit works so just just going through the code uh, the exploit just create a, a directory. A, a directory is mounting the um, uh, the C group controller inside this uh, this directory with the the option RDMA, and also is creating the C group um, uh, directory inside it. Also, as we as we can see, the the notify release is set to one. And as we said, it just to enable the feature, and then all the other commands is done to uh, create the re the release agent with the malicious. A command that we want to execute. In this case, is just getting the path for, for from the overlays, and the, and the command that we want to execute. So in this case, being sh. So we we actually we are um, opening a shell in the in the host. And the last command is just used to uh, trigger the, the exploit, uh, running an echo command, um, and that's it. So once the echo command is going to to terminate. Uh, notifying releases is, is, in, is enabled, is going to trigger uh, the workflow and, and, and executing the malicious command that is inside the, um, the, re the release agent. Uh, so just to recap what we have said um, so far. So we have these three techniques, all the, th uh, the three techniques that we have presented are using three different uh, capabilities. And so now we let's see uh, um, what we did in uh, in Falco uh, uh, in order to uh, detect those uh, this malicious behavior and how we can, and what we can do with Falco for uh, monitoring the capabilities. Yeah, thanks Stefano for going that with such examples. And so now that we are aware about how capabilities work and how they can be re used in real attacks, we want to show you um, how to monitor them using Falco. So for those of you who doesn't know about Falco, Falco is an open source project for runtime security, and it, can, it became the de facto standard for Kubernetes threat detection. It was originally created by SysDig and then donated to the CNCF, and it's currently at incubation level. And we both work uh, for it to become better and better, and we always try to improve it, uh, its detection capabilities. So uh, another thing that uh, it's exciting about Falco is its vibrant community. And I think that it's really nice to work in a, such an environment because people are really active and contributing. And hopefully this talk that shows uh, an extension that we made uh, to Falco will encourage you to do the same and improve it uh, and make it become better and better. So uh, before we dig into the details on how we extended Falco to monitor capabilities, let me give everybody a little of overview about it. Um, we can say that Falco is powered by its kernel module and its eBPF probe to collect system calls uh, data directly from the kernel, which is considered the source of truth for uh, our purposes. So uh, both of the event collection components use a ring buffer um, uh, to push events uh, that are uh, manipulated and uh, used in user space and in our libraries. 
Uh, what I would like to stress most about this is that um, uh, there is a part in a, one of our, our libraries that is responsible for maintaining the state of the system. And this part is, of course, in libsims, as, as you can see. And um, what, we do, what, 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 do you, what we do with this part of uh, state is uh, um, um, making it accessible uh, uh, by conditions and rules and uh, making it able to write um, rules and conditions able to spot new kind of attacks. So uh, with this in mind, we realized that Falco um, was only able to see in black and white, uh, meaning that uh, it was only able to uh, discriminate and distinguish root and root processes. And we wanted to put some light in that gray area that uh, capabilities have created um, in between. So uh, to summarize the part of the work uh, that we have done, um, we, we can do it in, in explaining the two main steps. Um, so basically uh, what we did is that uh, when Falco starts, uh, it needs to be to build the state of the world, that is the state of the, uh, the actual system state at a given point in time, that is uh, when Falco starts. And most of the information used to do this uh, comes from the proc file system. And fortunately, there is a file in the proc file system uh, which uh, uh, lets us retrieve information about uh, all uh, uh, capabilities about, of the process. And we use this to populate the initial uh, state. So once this is built, um, Falco starts capturing system calls and keeps updating it using system call data. So what we did is enumerating all the possible system calls that may interact with uh, a process and modifying uh, its own capabilities. And we started with the fork system call, which was uh, the easiest one, uh, because basically we only have to uh, copy the capabilities from the parent process uh, to, the to the child. And almost the same goes for the clone system calls, except for uh, those clone that creates new namespaces. And um, moreover, to push uh, to use the space, the new capabilities also in the um, exec VA, we modified the event of exec VA uh, to push information about capabilities also in that case. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, also the possibility to move capabilities in between sets, as we already know. And this is usually done with the cap set uh, system calls. And to do so, um, we implemented the, uh, the monitoring for that, uh, for that uh, system calls from scratch. So in this way, we are able to uh, let rules extract capabilities from the state, and we can write some interesting rules to spot uh, attacks based on capabilities. And now uh, Stefano will show you uh, what kind of rules we came up with, and hopefully it is, it is uh, uh, interesting uh, to see it together. So thanks, and thanks to the Lorenz work on, uh, on Falco, we are now able to uh, use capabilities inside uh, Falco rules. Uh, this is a, a rule that we created in order to um, uh, to control and, and, and detect if someone uh, uh, deploy a new container with, uh, with excessive capabilities. Uh, so as we can see here, just a two word on how, how uh, FICO rules work. Um, so the FICO rules are loaded inside the FICO engine and once a, a new syscall come in, uh, FICO engine is able to um, check and, and merge uh, all the uh, all the rules and checking if, if a rule match with the, with the Cisco, uh, FICO is, is able to trigger a security alert. And that's how it works. So let's see the condition here. So uh, the, the rule is going to trigger when we create a new container with excessive capabilities and, and the macro uh, shows all the capabilities that we are monitoring in this case. And as you can see, there are Sys module and uh, CSP trace, there are the two capabilities that we have talked before. Uh, and in, in the bottom, we can see the, um, uh, the output from, from FICO. And also, uh, we have also uh, the, the other rule that we created. This is uh, specific for the use case that we talked before about the release agent file. So as we uh, discussed before, uh, the, the attacker needs to modify the release agent file in order to 
uh, inject the code that he wants to, uh, to execute, and that's mainly where we create the detection. So once uh, the, the release agent file is open, is open to write uh, in commands, um, and also the, the container has the, the sysadmin capability and the user uh, is root, we are going to raise a security alert. And in the bottom we see uh, the output uh, mentioning all the capabilities uh, available. So we can see the cap sysadmin is one of them. Uh, and in this way we are able to detect with a very low false positive um, the, the potential malicious behavior. So having said that, this is it from my side. I'll let uh, Lorenzo close uh, the session and start the, the Q&A. Yeah, that was basically it. Hope you have enjoyed the talk. And if you have some questions, feel free to reach out now or in, in the Falco Kubernetes uh, Slack. And that's it. Uh, hope you have enjoyed the talk and you will uh, use capabilities or uh, try to improve rules and hopefully com contribute to get uh, to be able to improve Falco uh, always. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for being here. here. Thank you. So, if you have any, someone has any question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to use Falco in your cluster, there are M charts to do that, and you can use, they are officially provided by the Falco security organization. Is and it a that I yeah, it, it, when you want it to use in Kubernetes, <laughs> um, it can be used as uh, containers, and uh, you know, the M chart will um, uh, spawn pods on each node in the cluster as a demo set. And that's, that's it, basically. You can use this to deploy Falco. Or, or Falco is also deployable uh, on a node, and you can use uh, our packages to, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe an obvious question for Falco. We see all the uh, rule configurations that go in the uh, YAML, uh, yeah. configuration for the cluster. Does Falco look also into those type of, of aspects? Do we consider that any configuration that occurs is treated as an event and then Falco will see and analyze or these are two separate? No, no, this is um, just a different uh, thing because Falco it's uh, runtime security. It only, it, it doesn't look about configuration in the, uh, in the YAML. It, it only looks at runtime if uh, a process is being executed with uh, a specific capability or not. And I don't know if this un answers your, your question. Well, uh, these are configuration that can happen at runtime, so it's still part of the runtime. Right? I, change, I do a change in my environment, is this going to be captured or not? Yeah, if you, if you spawn another pod with uh, different uh, capabilities, it, it will be captured at the runtime by Falco. Thank you. Yeah, that's. Yeah. What? So, with, if if I'm able now to capture at runtime also those type of configuration, uh, do I have an overlap? Or do I always need to have both of them because there are configuration types that cannot be captured by, by the uh, event triggering? I'm looking if, I, if I'm allowing Falco to be able to detect all the configurations at runtime that happen through these you know, YAML configurations, do I have a duplication now? I have the rule engines that detect that. I have also uh, a Falco that is looking from a logging perspective to the same thing. Do I have a duplication? Can I focus only on one of them? Okay, so they will be like, treated as different. Falco will have, okay, or maybe there is an overlap, but not big enough to separate. 
There is no overlap. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just looking at the rule. Uh, I see that you are actually ignoring Falco because you're running as a privilege. Is that correct? The yeah. privilege rule? Uh, yeah, it says not Falco yeah. privileged. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Sorry. This one, right? That one, yes. A condition? It says and not Falco privileged container. Yeah, the other, other macros are used to, uh, to reduce false positive. I, I haven't reported the, 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 all the macros because it's hard to fit all in, in, in the slide, but there are uh, other macros that are reported to uh, reduce false, po uh, false positive in environments sometimes. So usually macros are used to simplify the overall condition to make it more readable. Uh, and sometimes we use um, macros to uh, reduce false positive or, or uh, at least some use cases that we know uh, is going to trigger for positive. So, and, and that's one of one of those uh, cases. But yeah, in general, we can use macros for for those reasons. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if, if you are saying if, if it is possible to deploy Falco without privileges, yeah. um, Falco uh, it's um, a specific um, a unique workload because uh, it has to inspect the system, so it has to have some privileges, of course. And um, we have uh, in the Elm charts we we try to uh, run the, our BPF probe with uh, these privileges, and there is there is an option to do that. But in general, it has to have some privileges. Right. Okay. I think that answers your question, right? Uh, so they are ignoring it because it is already privileged. And if they select, then it's a false positive alert erasing yeah. for the yeah. code yeah. itself. This was used yeah. to yeah. avoid false positive on it. it. There may not be an option to run without privilege mode. That's what he said. It needs some privileges to run. Uh -huh. Who is securing uh, Falco, I guess? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, we, uh, this is a security uh, tool, right? right? So it needs to have visibility over, uh, over what is going on. Otherwise, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's not going to work. It's a security tool, and we need to have visibility over, um, over what is going on. So that's, that's the main point of all of this, right? So the, of course, there are ways to, uh, as we said, with the, uh, with the uh, eBPF to reduce this kind of, um, of visibility for FICO, but this is mandatory for the type of tool that we are using and to have visibility. So I, I guess, I mean, I think most of other tools are basically using the same way. Uh, since, I mean, it's not possible to do any, any way. Uh, in other ways. So, of course, we can reduce it, but at the end, it's something that we need in order to have visibility. And, of course, we want to have visibility uh, in order to provide the best detection possible. So, I think that's the point. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, thanks, everyone, and I wish you a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.